I'm in Melbourne and uh, we had a little bit of a technical glitch at the start so sorry for the late um, start. So by way of introduction and super excited to have Lisa Messenger on the couch so to speak today with us. Um, so for those of you who don't know Lisa, Lisa is a, one of the most vibrant and energised people I've ever met. Uh, she's also the game-changing founder and CEO of The Collective Hub. She's an international speaker, best-selling author, investor and an authority on disruption in multiple industries. Never, never has it been more relevant from a disruption perspective. Um, she launched The Collective Hub as a print magazine in 2013 with no experience in a highly saturated industry that people said was either dead or dying. Uh, Collective Hub went on to become an international multimedia business and lifestyle platform uh, with the print magazine going into 37 countries. It was incredible. In 2018, she decided to pivot. We've been hearing the word pivot a lot over the last few days. So uh, Lisa and I'll have a bit of a chat, chat about that later on and focus less on print and more on the other facets of the business, decentralizing her entire team in the process. She has really strong messaging around the power of purpose, mindset, and there are no more uh, currencies, uh, there are no, there are, sorry, that there are more currencies in cash. Um, and the future of work, working in a decentralised, flexible, borderless work environment. So today, Lisa and I are going to have a chat about what it's like to actually be working from home and be working from absolutely anywhere. She also has, I'm just going to give you a bit of a plug here, she also has this great book called Work From Wherever. So maybe we'll just kick off with a little bit sort of a, of a more of a personal question before we get into work, Lisa, and just tell us a little bit about yourself and where it all started. Thank you, Anne. And it's so beautiful to see so, so many smiling faces. And also, I must say, thanks to the beauty of technology, I look like I'm sitting in my office that cost me $350,000 a year, but actually I'm sitting at home. I just have a photo behind me, so smoke and mirrors. Um, <laughs> but it's beautiful to be here. Uh, did you say what did I want to be? Before yeah, what did you want to be when you, grew, when you were growing up? What did you want to be? I wanted to be a horse riding instructor. Um, I grew up on a four and a half thousand acre property in the middle of nowhere for technology and um, I rode my horse every day after school and I think there was nothing like the feeling of freedom of galloping through the paddock unencumbered every single day. Fantastic and so then obviously you've pivoted somewhere along the way because clearly you're not doing horse riding anymore. Um, so how did you end up doing what you're actually doing now? And where did that sort of start for you? Oh my gosh, without showing my age, does anyone else having grey roots problem at the moment? I'm like, the, wow. you know, the <laughs> first world problems, but a long career. I actually spent eight years in conference and event management, interestingly enough, as a PCO. So I understand the other side, which is beautiful. And it was an amazing start to my career. And then in 2001, I started my first business, 22nd of October 2001. And what I did for the next 11 years was over service, under charge, fumble along. Someone doesn't have their. <laughs> yeah. Somebody is, yeah. Somebody <laughs> They're typing away. <laughs> Mute your microphone. <laughs> Who is that officer? Anyway, so yeah, so I started 22nd of October 2001. And what's interesting about that, and many people will relate to this, is for the next 11 years, I over-serviced, under-charged, was everything to everyone, had no real semblance of who I was, was leading life according to other people's expectations. And then I find that being comfortable as I was is not a great place to be, and I was kind of annoyed. So. In 2013, which Anne mentioned before, I launched a magazine called Collective Hub. And I'd had many, many years of kind of building up the resilience muscle and having lots of failures and trying lots of different things and being an integrated marketing agency. And starting the magazine really came from a place of, I've been an entrepreneur for such a long time. I was surrounded by these extraordinary people and innovators, but I felt that the media was, wasn't telling the story behind the story. You'd hear about, you know, Saxons is amazing or Anne's amazing, but I was always left going, but why, but why, but how, but how? So as Anne said, 
I just had this idea and I think that's often where it starts. Like when you have a really burning purpose, then the synchronicity and the serendipity and all just kind of comes together. So I launched into a highly saturated market of five and a half thousand print magazines with no idea what I was doing. A market people said was dead or dying <laughs> and no money, no smarts, no credibility. And within 18 months, that magazine was in 37 countries. And I had people like, one day I had an, an, an email, which was, is still quite sur surreal. Um, and just said in the subject line from the office of Anna Wintour. And she asked me to fly to New York and meet with her. And so, I am here to say that absolutely anything is possible and it grew and grew and grew and it grew because I used more currencies than cash and I tapped into like-minded non-competing partners and I thought divergently from the start. So yeah, the rest is history. I've written nine books charting the journey in real time over the last um, six years and that in itself is interesting and testament to anything's possible because at school I did what was classified unceremoniously as veggie English for the stupid people who couldn't <laughs> who couldn't write and I've now written I think 26 books no one read the first 18 <laughs> but they are out there <laughs> and I have a magazine or I had a magazine in many countries so we can get into how that all evolved and how I did that as we go through yeah no problem so maybe <laughs> uh, just a little bit about life outside what we see so what's life outside sort of work what do you do to sort of yeah for fun <laughs> yeah for fun and you know you sort of you know you, you you talk about working from anywhere and there's so many people now working from home that have never worked from home before um i'm calling it the corona curve because i just seem to be continually <laughs> eating but um i think that you know how do people how do you look after yourself how do you maintain a routine and what would be your recommendations to people out there working from home yeah so th there's so many it's really interesting because um, I decided to break the very thing that I started and I've written a book called Risk and Resilience, which um, here, which on the cover is all about breaking, breaking it to remake a brand. And, um, you know, I talk about pivot and start up and scale up and all that kind of thing. And it's interesting. So for the last two years since I decided to decentralize my entire team from the office behind me and have people working all over the world, I've been um, speaking <clears throat> globally on the topic. I just was the closing speaker for the global HP conference and I'm doing some speaking for Microsoft at the moment. But what's interesting was two or three weeks ago, I was an anomaly. I was like, how are you doing this? This is crazy. Like, how are you decentralizing? How are you trusting people? How are you, um, you know, what's the productivity like? What are the rituals and routines mm -hmm. like? How do you, what processes, what systems do you use? What technology supports it? And I feel like I'm no longer, you know, I'm the norm suddenly. Everyone else has been turbocharged into this crazy climate. And so I feel like I'm fortunate in a way that I've had, you know, 24 months actually practicing this. So what I would say around that is because I understand because it took me such a long time to shift my mindset to let my staff be free. Um, what I would say is it is so much about rituals and routines, you know, and that's sort of contrary to everything I believe as an entrepreneur about being, you know, divergent and bucking the status quo. But it is only because I am very regimented and have the discipline and I get up and, you know, I, I do my yoga from seven till eight. I meditate. I, you know, make sure I have a green smoothie. So then if I have hot chips for lunch, it's okay. <laughs> so there's certain things I do and I put into my schedule and into my day. These are the times I'm going to have my Zoom calls. This is the KPIs and the outputs that I want to reach. Then my entire team, which has been decentralized for a long time, we have daily pulse checks. We use Zoom like we're using all the time at the moment, you know, to connect in real time. We use Asana so that we have all our to-do lists. Everyone knows exactly what projects they're working on, what the timelines are, what the deliverables are. And so I think we can't underestimate the power of discipline, rituals and routines in this time because I understand, because I've been there, that a lot of people are used to, you know, I go to work from nine to five or eight to six or whatever it is, but my sense of purpose is dictated by I know where I'm going. 
I know who I'm high-fiving when I get to the office. I know where I sit. I know who I'm working with. I know how my output is measured, which is bums on seats and time in office. And suddenly it's massive to actually have a mindset shift around that. So I'm very, I'm very aware. I'm very fortunate in a way that I kind of stepped into this a while ago. So I'm, I'm trying to speak and help a lot of people around not only the mindset, but also the tools that enable us to do this. Because there's a lot of question at the moment, a lot of fear about both. Mm. I'm actually, I mean, dare I say it in this climate, I'm actually excited. I mean, I'm very sad for everything that's going on and I feel very deeply I'm an empath, but I'm also quietly excited because as an entrepreneur who's used to being nimble and flexible and, and able to adapt and pivot on a dime, I get excited because where other people see you know, crisis or they see um, problems, I see solutions and I see opportunities and I see gaps and I see that it is an opportunity for all of us to turbocharge into a new way of thinking and a new way of being. So I kind of like it, if that's okay to say. <laughs> I thrive in this environment. I think, you know, as we sort of, as we transition and come out of COVID-19, I think, you know, many businesses will be very different to what they were just even four weeks ago. You know, in terms of you sort of talking about finding opportunities and things like that, just sort of give a couple of hints about how you actually go about doing that. How do you look for the opportunities and then ultimately find them? Um, so from, I can talk to a few things. I can talk yeah. a bit about my business and what I've been doing. So, um, so largely what I do is I have print products, I have digital products and I have events. So events is a big part of my business and alongside Saxton's speaking is a big part of my business. So, you know, we've had to pivot. And again, I feel like it's such an overused, oversaturated word. I felt like I kind of had a little bit of ownership over that <laughs> previously. Not anymore. <laughs> Um, so I've been looking at each part of my business. Um, we were bringing out 37 print products this year. I'm still actually doing that. And interestingly enough, because so many of my products are relevant, so I'm bringing, I mean, a book that I've already, um, I'm 80% through writing is how to have a side hustle. So a lot of my stuff, because I've been thinking divergently for a long time is actually relevant and kind of needed by the market at the moment, but I'm I'm being quick to repackage and rebundle. Like my book, Work From Wherever and Risk and Resilience, the previous one where I nearly lost everything. I mean, that was the biggest crisis that I have had. And that was around the magazine for the first three and a half years. You know, it was extraordinary. And then I scaled too quickly. I didn't have the right systems and processes in place and I very nearly lost everything. So for example, both of those books and those topics, which are, you know, combined 60,000 words, it's very easy for me to quickly repurpose that and it's very relevant content to slice and dice, do you know what I mean? And then from a speaking perspective, well, I'm just, you know, every single day, I think many of us are turning our homes into home studios, I'm recording, I'm creating digital masterclasses, I'm creating relevant content, and then I'm just thinking on my feet around, you know, how can I help, who can I consult to? So for me, I feel like I'm almost busier than ever. But um, but I'll give you some examples of some other people. I was chatting to a friend of mine, Paul Short, just yesterday, who owns Prince of York. It's a restaurant in Sydney. And while a lot of, you know, I know Anne's partner and my fiance are both in, um, you know, hospitality, and that is a dire industry at the moment, as is events. But I was speaking to Paul Short, and he said to me, Lisa, and I actually wrote it down. He's like, Lisa, I don't know if this is bad. He said, I'm excited. He said, I feel like a little speedboat. And I said, why is that? Like everyone else is closing their doors. And he said, well, I'm noticing a gap in the market. You know, Coles and Woolies and the big guys can't keep up with pasta and supply of meat. So we've just recalibrated our entire team so that they're either in the kitchen making these foods or they're out there driving trucks and he said two weeks ago I had one business a bricks and mortar restaurant he said now I have three businesses I've got you know and he said so I feel like I'm able to duck and weave and pivot and be nimble and adaptable and he said my revenue at the moment is only a third of what it was when we were peak but he said if we keep tracking I think I can bring it back to where it was within a couple of weeks um I'm doing con some consulting to a big group of small businesses at the moment for free because I just want to help 
small businesses out and they have 30 of them on a Zoom call every Thursday night at seven o'clock. One of them a week ago, Tamara, she has a dance studio in Sydney's Western suburbs and she was in tears just seven days ago, small business. She said, Lisa, everyone comes into the studio. I don't know what to do. And, um, and last Thursday, so it was two weeks ago, last Thursday night, everyone else was sitting on the call and I got to her and I said, Tamara, my, you know, how are you going? And, she's, and I'd given her some advice about um, tools to use to bring dance studio into her living room and to bring people online. She actually laughed instead of crying and she said, Lisa, I just had 17 people like an hour ago come to my dance lesson and they all paid the same as they would pay in the studio. So I think, you know, they're really simple examples, but I think there is opportunity for all of us if we're open to it in this time. And I think it is an exciting time if we choose, I always go there's a duality, we can choose to be the glass half full people or Mm. the gunners or the pity parties or we can be like what's the opportunity what can I do here how can I use this opportunity to actually grow my mindset and you know step into technology and think about the greatest dream I've ever had and how do I make that happen now um yeah fantastic thank you some great examples in there we've got a we've had a question from the floor so I'm going to sort of pivot yes. a little bit so <laughs> one of the questions from the floor from the lovely Meg is uh how do you sort of personally motivate your staff whilst working remotely? How do you keep them engaged? So thank you, Meg, great question. Twofold, um, I think it's very much about, and I run multiple businesses now, so Collective Hub and what I talked about, um, the print digital and events is just one side. I'm also launching um, a pet startup this year. So I've got multiple teams. Whichever team it is, it's about two things. It's about what's the overarching vision of the company? What are we all working for together? What's our purpose? What's our mission? What's the overarching theme? What's the meaning that we want to derive from work every single day? You know, what are our KPIs? What are our big goals? What are we aiming for? So everyone gets 100% on the same page about the overarching vision and mission of the company. But of equal importance, which I spend a lot of time with my teams on is what is your personal vision, mission, goals in life? How do you want to work? And this is such an important thing because when you can get those two things to overlay and marry and come together, then you have an extraordinary culture. And so what I learned, and I'll give you an example, why I decentralized, one of the main reasons I decentralized two years ago is that my editor, Amy, um, about 18 months prior had asked me, and at the time I thought this was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. She said to me, Lisa, can I go traveling for four months through South, through South America? See, I still choke on it. <laughs> while, I'm still, while I'm still working for you full time, right? She was on like 85 grand or something. At the time, I remember almost having a conniption because at the time, even though I'm a forward thinker, I needed to see my staff. I needed to see them in the office. I needed to see what they were doing, right? So when she said, can I travel for four months, still get paid the same money? I was like, oh my gosh. She was one of my most extraordinary staff members. So you know what? I said, yes. But before she went, I gave her very specific KPIs. I mean, one, she had to produce a global magazine for me every month. She needed to be able to run all her staff, you know, from South America. So there were very specific things that I worked with her on. Do you know what? In that four months, her output was insane. So when she got back to Australia, she said to me, I want to move out of Sydney. I want to move down to Kayama on the South Coast. And I said to her, okay. And that was one of the things, as I started to think about it, I thought my team are actually so much more happy and much more productive if they're able to work when they want, how they want, at a time they want, in a place they want. And I also realized that so many people, their lifestyles are different, right? My partner gets up at 3.59 a.m. every morning. That's when he works really, really well. I would sleep till 8 a.m. every morning quite happily. <laughs> Other people want to pick up their kids from school at 3 and that's really important and they want to work at 10 p.m. So I suddenly started to realize why am I keeping everyone in the confines of an office? And also what that meant was 
I was relying on the fact that the best staff on the planet were within a 20 kilometer radius of my headquarters in Surrey Hills in Sydney, right? And so that's when I started thinking. So to answer your question, Meg, it's really that twofold thing. It's about the vision for the company and the vision for the individual and how do they marry and come together. And as long as they're respecting both, then they can have as much flexibility and freedom as they want, as long as they're producing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a that, that's really good. I actually see lots of people taking notes while you were talking then, Lisa. So fantastic. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's really, it's really good. Get, it was it's great takeaway. <laughs> it's hard to get your mindset around and I know because I was there and I, I was one of those bosses. Even though I always had fun at work, I'd still be like, where are they? They're not here at 9 a.m. Or oh my gosh, I can't believe they left at five o'clock. Or oh, they just had a I was watching, they had an hour for lunch. And you know what? That was me. That was my stuff. As soon as I let them go, don't get me wrong, every day we have pulse checks and check-ins and everyone has very cool. specific deliverables. But, um, yeah, I just changed the way that I thought. Yeah. And everybody out there, feel free to ask questions. Lisa has said nothing's off the table, so now's your time to ask her anything you want. Um, so just given everything that's been going on, maybe just tell us what's one thing that you'll never take for granted again? Oh, hugs. <laughs> hugs. But also, I mean, I'm a hugger and, and kind of purposefully so. And I think, you know, the corporate environment even more so because everyone's like a very handshaky, very, you know, corporate staunch thing. And I've always been like, let's give some empathy. Let's give some love. Let's bring some human connection. What I will say about that though is this i don't know if you guys have all felt this but over the last few weeks i actually almost ironically feel more connected to a lot of people than i have ever done because i've been doing for example an insta live so a live on my instagram at 1 p.m every single day and every day i've been having either a guest on someone that i know well or i've just been opening it up to small businesses and letting them come on and tell them tell me what's your small business and you know how can we help you and i've got a following on my instagram of 133,000 people so it's been beautiful to see you know to give other small business as a platform and a voice to share and it's extraordinary people are like I had someone on two days ago who um, is in a little country town in Victoria and she's got a hamper a hamper business and she's supporting other small businesses and I was watching the comments in the feed people saying oh my gosh I just jumped online and I ordered your hamper or how can I support and I was just like this is beautiful and I think we're also I mean my mom who's you know, fairly technologically inept. I love her more than anything. She's using Zoom, you know. We're having Zoom family dinner parties. Now, we would never have done that before. She lives in Byron Bay. You know, we jump on a call, you know, a couple of times a week. But now we're actually having this. So, in a way, whilst hugs is the thing I miss, I think the connectivity and yeah. us all being a bit more human about it is actually a, quite a beautiful byproduct of this horrible crisis we find ourselves in okay awesome great 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 response i've got a question for you um from demetria how did you get the confidence to start your first business and how did you make the leap and transition from working for someone to yourself well there's a fairly easy answer question. to the, the transition is it Dimitri? yeah yeah, thank you. So um, in 2001, I was working for a sponsorship agency. So essentially doing sponsorship for the events industry. I was doing sponsorship for Cirque du Soleil and the Wiggles and Barry Humphreys. And that's kind of largely where I learned to think differently. But I think I had always had a burning desire within me. Um, I was a painful employee. I was always saying to my bosses, I want equity, even though I didn't know what equity meant. And so kind of the easy decision was made for me my boss adam who's still a good friend <laughs> said to me lisa i think it's time you went and did your own thing i mean i think he fired me but in the nicest possible way <laughs> and it was the greatest blessing because it just kind of set me free and I just bumbled along. And as I said before, you know, the next 11 years, I kind of over-serviced, undercharged, was everything to everyone, didn't really have any idea what I was doing. It was a bit silly in a way because I, I didn't, you know, have mentors. I wasn't part of networking groups. I mean, maybe I was a slow learner, but maybe I was exactly 
where I needed to be. Because the confidence thing is an interesting one and it's something I get asked a lot about. I think it's a, it's a muscle that you build and it's about getting comfortable being uncomfortable, another cliche, but for a reason, right? And I remember this and this may put it into perspective. I remember when I started my business that, um, that I got an invoice or someone, or I owed someone. I can't remember which it was. I just remember that the figure was $80. And I remember freaking out thinking, how am I going to pay this? Or when are they going to pay me? Whichever it was, I just remember the feeling around it. And over the years, and it doesn't matter where you are, you keep pushing it and pushing it and taking slightly bigger risks. And so now what happens is if someone owes me 80 grand or 800 grand actually doesn't matter anymore. The figures are just a lot different. My reaction is much calmer because now what I do is I've learned to do something tricky, which is quickly reverse engineering from a bad situation. And I think when you start out or you're a solopreneur or you've not done something before, our propensity for risk it's not there and we're much more fearful. So I, I like gamifying things. So I have a little thing that I play now. However bad a situation gets, I let myself go there quickly in my mind's eye and I feel the pain. Like I go to worst case scenario, but I only stay there for, I've trained myself probably a minute, 30 seconds. I don't stay in the pain too long. And then I reverse engineer and I go, who outside of me can help me? Is it my accountant? Is it my CFO? Is it my lawyer? Is it and from Saxton's, who in my circle of influence can help me? Then I reverse engineer it back to present moment and suddenly I feel okay and I've got the confidence. And I think that's a mistake many of us make is that we think that we need to do something on our own and actually it's all about having a team of extraordinary people around us, hiring your weaknesses. And that's what gives me the confidence. I'm also kind of crazy and I push the limits in every single way and I, I push myself, push myself, push myself. I fail a lot, but I'm unafraid to fail now. I use failure as a lesson. So it's about reframing that and getting comfortable with that. And um, I, I make lots of mini failures every single day. I try not to have too many big failures, but I think that's how we grow and learn and that's how we get confident. Yeah, brilliant. Totally agree. Lots of failures going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, so a question from Michael, with so many opportunities and good ideas on the table, what's your prioritization, prior, how do you prioritize? <laughs> Michael, one of the best questions ever, because um, someone reminded me recently that uh, focus is key. They remind me I was on a panel when I launched Collective Hub. And because I had a brand that was loved by so many and grew so fast, um, this guy, Chris, who started Pedestrian, he said, I was on a panel with you and you sat there and you proudly said, I have 17 different revenue streams. And, and I was you know, very proud about that at the time. What I've since realized is that is an absolutely crazy way to run a business. And as an entrepreneur or <clears throat> for any of us who are innovative or entrepreneurs, you know, entrepreneurial, but working within the confines of a big corporation, our brains are like this. Oh, bright, shiny thing. Oh, exciting opportunity. And the bigger your brand becomes and the more you step into your purpose, the more opportunities come at you. So I, I make it really simple. My litmus test is this. Um, I say that I am an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything is possible and that I'm here, <clears throat> excuse me, to ignite human potential. Three words. That is as simple or as complex as it gets. Ignite human potential. So that is the litmus test every single day. So when someone comes to me and says, Lisa, let's create a shoe brand. And I go like this, oh, amazing. I could do that. I know how to do things. I can make it all happen. Business is the same. Supply chains, funding, you know, it's essentially the same. And then I go back and go, is that igniting human potential? Does that feed my purpose? Does that serve my community? No, it doesn't. So I think it's really, really important to stay in your lane and stay focused. And what I would say about that is this, and this is so important for all corporates, and I actually talk a lot about this um, when I do my keynotes. It's about know what your purpose is and what feeling do you want your audience to have? Because so many people would do this. They're like, oh yeah, I produce chairs for a living. And that's great, but what happens, I mean, I'm being a bit ridiculous, but what happens if in six months time, we're all on flying carpets, you know, chairs are no longer relevant. So I always go, think about what's your purpose 
What's your overarching thing? What do you want to deliver? What's the feeling you want people to have? And that way you stay completely focused, but you're able to morph, iterate, pivot, change, right? So I said, when I wrote my very first editor's letter <clears throat> for Collective Hub in March 2013, and I went on to do 54 issues of that magazine. But luckily for me, in the very first editor's letter, I said, it is irrelevant if I'm doing a print magazine, if I'm speaking, if I'm running a workshop, if I'm doing a digital masterclass, if I'm writing a book or a myriad of other things. As long as I'm igniting human potential, the delivery mechanism is irrelevant. So I maintain precision focus about what it is that I stand for and what I'm delivering and the feeling I want people to have, but I allow myself to move with the market and move with the client according to what people need. And that is why things like coronavirus, whilst I'm very sad for many people and I'm feeling a lot of people's pain, it's not really affecting my business because I'm able to move and pivot and I know 100% what I stand for and I know <clears throat> very quickly how to productize and how to diversify. Does that make sense? Yeah. Keep your focus, but be able to diversify. Yep, awesome. I think uh, I'm just really mindful of time and I know people have got to jump off. So I'm going to finish on a bit of a lighter note before we wrap up. So one of the questions is from Vicky, what is in your green smoothie? <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. It's actually very boring. <clears throat> we pretty much have it every single morning. So it is literally like an entire bag of baby spinach and then a banana and a couple of dates. But if I have like some strawberries or something, I'll pop that in. Sometimes I'll pop in some collagen powder. But do you know what? It comes back to rituals and routines. It's like, it's almost like if you're having one thing that you start the day with that is healthy and it's not too complex and you can just make it and drink it down. It's kind of like we trick ourselves into going, okay, I feel good. I've started the day well. And I think, I think that's part of it. You know, if you're used to getting up and going to an office or used to getting up and going to a gym, what can we do now to get up and do something because let's face it, the rug has been pulled out from most of us in more ways than we could ever imagined possible. So as long as you start to put a few little um, rituals and routines and things that make you feel good and start the day right, then it's all good. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so what I'd like to see everybody do now, tomorrow morning when you all get up and make your green smoothie, make sure you tag Lisa Messenger in it so we can all see your green smoothie. <laughs> yeah. I will tag me on Instagram and I'll repurpose. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Uh, Lisa, thank you so I'm just going to double check. I think there's one more question before we jump off. Hang on one sec. No, everybody's just saying thank you so much, Lisa. It's been inspiring. People have got so much out of it. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day-to-day -to, -day to share with our community and help support them through this time. Really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. And just a quick my pleasure, Anne. And, and I just want to say as well, I look forward to meeting so many of you in person and supporting you however I can. And, um, and a big shout out to Anne and Saxton's. I mean, it's not an easy time for you guys. And you're certainly pivoting and diversifying very, very quickly. And um, I'm in it for the long haul. You guys are like my family and my partners. And I love you. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, no, thank you. We're just about trying to support our community like you're supporting your community. So um, just a reminder to everybody that next Tuesday we have Kian McLaughlin on. So Kian's going to do the half an hour. He's a best-selling author and award winner. He's an MC. He's a sales expert. So um, he's also an unbelievable facilitator. He facilitated our leadership team meeting late last year. Um, and he can actually just talk you through, a he has a very unique perspective on what motivates and demotivates people when they're making a buying decision or trying to influence them. So look forward to having an on the couch chat with Kian next week. So thanks everybody for being a part of today and uh, look forward to seeing you all again next week. Take care and stay safe. See thanks you guys. Lisa.